delighted to be here with uh, with all of you. Um, I, my intention for today is to cover to cover three things, and the the stuff that I have to say about these three things is pretty straightforward. And so I'd love to invite you to chime in and ask questions. What the sorts of things that are on your mind based on what your priorities and and practices are, and what brought you to this. Uh, dialogue in in the first place, and so um, the three things that I want to talk about. One of one is the the underlying model of the the six conditions that most powerfully influence team effectiveness. And just to review the basic model that's come out of mine and my colleagues' research, where we've been focused for many years now on I think a a fundamentally practical question, which is, which I think is the the question that all of us are here to address in some form or other, and that is, how do you help people accomplish great things together? What are the things that you can do practically, reliably, high leverage things that you can do to increase the chances that when people come together to try and accomplish something, they do in fact accomplish something great? So we'll start with the model. What's the underlying model that we've derived from our research? Um, I, I'm going to put that in the context of talking about the team diagnostic survey, which is really what I'm here to talk with you about today. It's a, an instrument that we designed to help people to intervene in a really focused and effective way in trying to um, uh, improve the, the effectiveness of task performing teams. So I'll start with the model, and then I'll talk about the team diagnostic survey itself and, and give you an example of the, some, some of the kinds of things that come from uh, the online report that you can get if you use the Teams Diagnostic Survey with Teams. And then the third thing is to give you a couple of illustrations of how, how I've actually used it and how it could be helpful in your work with coaching and in intervening in task-performing teams. That's it. That's the three things I want to cover, the model, the survey itself, and some examples of how to use it. Um, and happy to, to take questions or launch in deeper discussions of any of those things as we go along. I've built in breaks into this presentation where I'm gonna, where I definitely will pause and take questions and discussion, but Krista is monitoring the chat for me. I'm happy to multitask and take questions at the same time. So, um, so if, uh, if you're watching the, slides in front of you. I know some of you are just participating by phone, but I, I went back and forth a bunch of times on what to title this, and I came out with helping teams by using the team diagnostic survey. It was originally coaching teams by using the team diagnostic survey, um, but what you're going to see is that Richard Hackman and I and our colleagues have been using the term coaching to mean a, a very particular kind of intervention in, in teams. And really what you'll see is that the focus of our work with teams is, is closer to what I would call design, designing teams right, or, or improving their effectiveness by redesigning them. Um, and you'll, you'll see why that's the underlying focus in just a minute. So why, what are we trying to, to accomplish in co co coaching and consulting to teams and how might the team diagnostic survey actually be helpful with that? Where, the, the question I posed here is, where do you actually start when you're trying to, um, to engage with a team or with a team leader or with many teams in order to improve their performance effectiveness? Um, and two of the questions about the, the starting point are, how do, how do I know how effective a team actually is if I haven't been living with it, if I've been asked to be helpful? And how do I efficiently learn about what might be driving the underlying causes of their poor performance? I don't know about you, but I very frequently get requests to help with a team that have built into it an interpretation about what's going wrong. So for example, I might have a team come to me and say something like, or a team member come to me and say, um, how do we deal with our problem member? Can you, can you teach me something about how to give really tough or constructive feedback to the person who's causing all our problems, right? So the, the, the implication is that I understand what the cause is and it's that particular individual. Um, I suspect that this, uh, this particular kind of question resonates with more than one of you because it's very common, um, it's very common to be part of a team, to be really struggling 
and and to sort of lay all of the blame on a single individual member it's a classic scapegoating process and and inevitably what teams un, uh, come to understand is if they remove their problem child somebody else steps up into the role of problem child that very seldom are the the underlying causes of why a team is struggling all down to the behavior or the ineffectiveness of one particular individual. To give you another illustration, I can, uh, I can remember very clearly having a chief executive come to me and say, I want you to help me with my leadership team. They're testing my authority. They're resisting convening as a team. When they're present, they're kind of, you know, surreptitiously checking their email under the table. I think they're testing my authority as a leader. That may or may not be true, but what do you do with that as somebody who's going to um, help this team? And how does that become some kind of starting point for thinking about how to intervene in the team or to choose strategies for coaching the team or the team leader that has some probability of actually really helping the team improve? In that latter example, the one that I just said about the, the team testing the leader's authority. I'll, I'll tell you a little further into this dialogue what it is that we actually discovered were driving those underlying um, behaviors of the team members. And it really had nothing to do with motives that were about power dynamics or testing the, the chief executive's authority. So Richard Hackman and I and Aaron Lehman built the team diagnostic survey for the purposes of helping teams, their members, their leaders, and people like us who consult and coach teams to be very focused and effective in the way that we go about helping teams. What does the team diagnostic survey do? Um, it starts by asking the question, and I'll, I'll share with you the way that we've defined it in our research, how effective is this team? Um, we have used in our research, um, Krista, if you can wind to the next slide, a tripartite definition of team effectiveness. So to us, a team is effective to the extent that what it produces is valued in the eyes of the team's client. Every team has a client, whether they're an internal to, to, the, uh, to the organization or whether they're external to the organization, and they're the ones who have the, the right and the ability to judge whether what the team is producing meets or exceeds their requirements from the team. Now that turns out to be a fairly complex thing to assess when you're talking about a leadership team, but um, because they have many different constituencies. But first and foremost is the team actually producing what it exists to, to produce. Second criterion of effectiveness is, in our view, a team is only effective if, you're, if it's showing signs of becoming increasingly capable as a performing unit over time, meaning it is able to solve challenges it couldn't do before, or it can solve the same problems but faster and more efficiently. Um, it's, it's able to rise to a greater level of performance uh, over time. There are lots of teams out there who are able to accomplish a single thing and burn themselves out in the process. So I don't know if you've ever had the experience of working with a team that got their work done and then stepped away and said, and I will never work with those people again. Um, organizations cannot afford that kind of burnout of collaborative capacity. So for in, in our model and in our research, a team is effective only to the extent that not only does it perform, but it's better and better able to perform as a, as a team over time. And then the third criterion of effectiveness for, for us throughout our research has been, what is the impact that the team has on the members themselves? Are they learning, growing, developing as a consequence of being a member of the team? Are they, is this development fostered by team membership or are they driven away, alienated, undermined, feel dumber as a consequence of, of being a member of the team? In our view, if you want to have an effective team, it's got to, it's got to uh, achieve all three criteria of effectiveness. So the, the, throughout our research, the question that we've been asking is, what are the things that most drive these three sets of outcomes and how can we go about seeing the degree to which any team is actually effective uh, on each of these criteria and then what is it that actually influences this ultimate effectiveness of teams. 
Yeah, thanks, Krista. I am starting at the end point for a reason. We're actually going to go backwards a little bit here. Um, you know, I started out by saying that very often the request to help a team comes with its own diagnosis. The person who asks for your help um, will, will tell you what they think the root causes of the problem are. Um, a, another commonplace um, presenting problem that you can hear has a great deal to do with the relationships or the dynamics or the interpersonal behavior that's going on in teams. And, you know, one of the things that we've learned over the course of our research is that interpersonal relationships are very seldom where they, we think they are in the causal chain. Meaning, if you develop really great personal relationships among the team members, it's probably not going to improve the team's effectiveness, right? That, that is a that is very frequently a symptom of some underlying problems of the team, but it's not a great point of intervention. In fact, I have to say, I think probably my favorite journal article title of all time is um, Kaplan's article, and, and the whole message is in the title. It's the conspicuous absence of evidence that process consultation improves team task performance. Got that? The conspicuous absence of evidence that process consultation improves team task performance. And what he did was conduct a meta-analysis and ask the question, what evidence exists that going in and intervening in the quality of the dynamics and relationships among team members actually helps them uh, to improve their effectiveness over time? And what he found was um, very few studies that showed any positive effects at all, a surprising number of studies that actually showed negative effects on team performance of process consultation. Not because, very, it's very unlikely that it's because process consultation makes performance worse. What it does do is distract the team members into focusing on all this work they're doing to improve their relationships and take their effort and energy and attention to the work itself. So the, the, the second thing that I want to say about what we've learned in our research is about the Ruth, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. Because I think you just dropped kind of a, you know, a big, a big thing there. And I'm curious how that lands on folks. I, so, I mean, I guess, you know, my, my follow-up question is then what is the role of process and relationships then in teams? Because I, I imagine that it is important. It's just under what conditions or, so I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of folks out there, we make a living because teams don't get along well, or there's a lot of interpersonal friction. You know, it's common in many teams, conflict in teams. So, so what does that say about coaching around the relationship side or the interpersonal dynamic side of, of team life? Well, it, you know, I have a fairly hard nosed view on this, which I'm happy to express. But, but if you, if, if the invitation is for your other, uh, your other colleagues to chime in on this, I'm, I'm happy to, to see how that has landed with people. Yeah. Well, they're silent, so I don't know how to read that because I dropped that in the chat window, but if anybody well, has, a, has a comment. Sure. Yeah. Well, let me give you just two sentences of, of perspective on, yeah. on that and where I, where I actually have come out, of it, uh, out on it. First of all, I think good quality relationships at work are desirable in and of themselves. And so if what you are, if you, what you are doing is intervening for the sake of creating trusting and effective dialogue among colleagues. I, I, again, I would underscore, I think that is a valuable thing for people's working lives um, in and of itself. It probably is not in the causal chain driving team performance effectiveness. Very often what we see that arises as personality conflicts or an inability for people to work together effectively is, is actually a symptom of something else. And what it most typically is a symptom of is poor team design in the first place. So where you see people behaving badly with each other or getting mired into conflicts with each other, it's because we have completely different understandings of what the purpose of this team actually is. Or the work that we are being asked to do as a team actually doesn't make sense to be done as a team. Or we never had any kind of conversation about the rules in, of engagement around here, and we have completely different understandings of what the norms of conduct ought to actually be in the team. And to me, each of those is a design feature that needs to be put in place. And when you see process problems arising among team members, it's a sign that you need to go back and run your design checklist and, and consider what aspects of the, of the team's design 
uh, are not in good shape in the first place. So actually, if it, if you want to um, forward this a little bit, I can talk about I can talk about um, what those design features are. But let me pause and see if, having said that, there's anything anybody wants to chime in on around the process stuff. There's a couple of comments in the chat window, you know, that people are making there. You know, it, what triggered for me is I spent a good 10 years working in conflict resolution training in organizations, in organizations where there was a lot of conflict. Yeah. And the conclusion I came to after 10 years of this, and my doctoral dissertation actually was on this very topic, was that a lot of the causes of conflict were structural in nature, yes. which echoes what you were saying. And so attempting to build people's skills in interpersonal conflict resolution and address it there, you were addressing the symptom rather than the root. And that's part of what actually took me to coaching because I felt we need to get proactive and ahead of designing teams that are healthy in the first place. So the lot that when conflict does arise, it's not because of structural causes. And that's where I think the relational skills and those skills become useful. But I felt like you could train, and there's interesting research on this, you can train everybody in conflict resolution skills, but if the causes are structural, the training doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. So anyways, I appreciated your, your um, extrapolating on that there. Well, I, I also really, I like where you went with that, which is it doesn't mean that conflict resolution skills are not worth teaching, but it's to what end. So... If the, if the fundamental structural problem that's causing conflict is that our, our reward system puts us in competition with each other for critical resources, or we, we are constantly launching and creating teams that have relatively trivial purposes or that have no authority, um, and I'm on to way too many of them in the first place, right? Those are both structural underlying problems. You can right. use those conflict resolution yeah. skills to negotiate a different arrangement in your organization. Honey, you're amazing. Let me just interrupt you real quick. So I think we have some folks joining. If you could make sure you keep your static coming in. Okay. I think yeah. I muted that there we go. person. Yeah, go ahead. So, so what I've got up here on the slide, this effort strategy, knowledge, and skill thing is, you know, one of the things that Richard and my colleagues and I asked in our research is, are there particular processes that you can observe and measure that drive performance effectiveness? And the answer is yes, and they're task-related processes. So these are the three. To the extent that people are putting in a lot of effort, they are building shared commitment to the team and to its work, they are putting in a lot of energy and motivation towards team tasks. That's one process. Secondly, they're making intelligent choices about the strategy, the approach they use in doing the work. And thirdly, they're using the full range of knowledge and skill that they have in the team. Those three task processes are very strong predictors of performance effectiveness and the, developing, uh, the development of individuals and teams as performing units over time. And these three processes are in some ways um, something that you can coach around. They are direct points of intervention, but they are also primarily driven by structural stuff. And, and that's the core message that I want to get across about our, our model. So our approach, if you'll see this in the next slide, is to focus on identifying the enabling conditions that together most increase the chances that you will get high levels of effort, really superb work strategies, and people using their full range of knowledge and skill in getting the work done. Um, so as you said earlier, we've gone backwards here from, you know, what do we mean by team effectiveness? What are the processes that drive it? And now we're going we're to go to the front end of the equation here, which is what are those enabling conditions that together most powerfully increase the chances that you will get a really terrific team? So um, just to, to talk a little bit about the, the research evidence and basis, um, Krista mentioned earlier that Richard Hackman wrote this book, Leading Teams, Setting the Stage for Great Performances. I still view it as the best leadership book ever written. Uh, it's a terrific summary of the, uh, not just of the research evidence, but really of how to use it in, in designing and leading teams and organizations. Um, you know, he and I and many of our colleagues have studied literally thousands of teams uh, in, in order to derive the, the evidence underlying this model and really focused on, on identifying the small handful of things that together really stack the deck in favor of, uh, of having a, a great performance effectiveness by teams. 
So what are the, what are the conditions? Um, take a look at the next slide. In fact, Krista, you can just run out the whole animation. Um, there you go. Oops. So we've identified six conditions, which in our recent work we've been summarizing as three essentials, which are three design conditions that really uh, need to be in basically good shape if you want to have any kind of team effectiveness at all. In fact, um, one of the things that we argue in the book is if you can't get the three essentials basically in good shape, it's better to try to figure out how to get the work done with something other than a team, disaggregating it and having various things accomplished by individuals. And then three that we call the enablers, which once the essentials are in place, really accelerate the development of a team into an essential and into an effective performing unit. So I'll take you through the, the six conditions um, relatively rapidly because I want to also spend some time talking about how you would use this uh, approach in actually working with teams. So the first condition is you want to have an effective team, you got to have a real team, meaning not a team in name only. Um, I, one of the things that I underscore in the book on, on senior leadership teams is that the vast majority of of groups at the tops of organizations that are called leadership teams are actually teams in name only. Um, we know that real teams perform better, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, but in fact, the three characteristics of being a real team, meaning that they are bounded, they're stable, they're interdependent for a common purpose, um, very often the membership among teams is so unstable that people cannot perceive themselves as a team, right? They're constantly people moving in and out. Every time the group convenes, it's a different configuration of individuals. And very often we just, uh, we, we see that the, the notion that we have clear boundaries and we know who is and who is not in a team is actually an illusion. Um, and this next slide is just an illustration of some of the data about from our leadership teams. One of the things that we did when we were studying leadership teams is um, you can stop right there, Krista. We, for every team that we studied, we went to the chief executive and we said, how many people are in your team? And in this instance, we have one chief executive who said, I, had 11, I have 11 people who are on my team, and the other one who said, five people are on my team. So we went to each of those individuals and we gave them the team diagnostic survey, which has a whole bunch of descriptive questions in it about the team, including how many, how many members are there in your team and here's what the 11 people said in, in their response to the question, how many people are in your team? Go ahead, Chris, you can just roll that forward and let the animation come out. So, and in team B, we have five people saying five, five, seven, eight. Go ahead, you can roll the rest of that animation seven, eight, and nine. Okay. You know, these are entertaining examples, but in fact, of the 120 senior leadership teams that we studied, only 11 of them actually agreed on the size of the team. How can we be an effective performing unit and share accountability for something if we don't know who we are? And what I want to underscore here is that this is a basic structural feature that we see in a lot of senior leadership teams for a variety of reasons that I can go into if we, if we actually have time. But fundamentally, this is a structural or a design problem that is gonna prevent these leadership teams from ever accomplishing their work effectively. So positive condition number one, you'll go to the next slide. If you wanna have an effective team, first and foremost, create a real team that has clear boundaries, that's interdependent for a common purpose, and that has some reasonable stability of membership in order to accomplish something together. The next of the essentials is a compelling direction. This is one of the things that we have seen is um, problematic, almost invariably a really difficult challenge for getting in place for a leadership team. What we mean by a compelling direction, as you'll see in the next slide, is that it has three characteristics. The ends that are specified, the reason that we exist as a team is clear, meaning we would know what it would look like if we were actually to get there. Secondly, it's challenging. It will be a real stretch of people's capabilities in order to accomplish it. And thirdly, it's consequential. It has real meaningful impact on the lives and work of others. If you'll go to the next slide, Krista. It's um, summarized in uh, this positive condition number two is summarized here. And I will say in our research, it's very, um, 
it's very evident that different kinds of teams tend to have different challenges with their purposes. So for example, a lot of frontline teams have very clear um, objectives and goals that they exist to accomplish, but they're not necessarily particularly consequential or particularly challenging. And, and that is a design feature that you can, that you can alter in order to increase the chances that people will bring their, their best and uh, highest capabilities and effort to the, to the party. Okay, so third of the six conditions, this is the third of the enablers, having the right people around the table. And I will just summarize on the next slide some of the most commonplace reasons that we've seen why it is that leaders often wind up with the wrong people on their teams. So for example, very often teams are formed as a consequence of people's location in the organization, right? We have to have a representative from each part of the organization and you're the head of that particular department and therefore you're going to be part of this team. Rather than asking, what does this team exist to accomplish and who can actually contribute to those purposes? Um, very often we also see that while people are quite attentive in composing a team to getting the right mix of skills in order to, to get the work done, they're not paying attention to whether people actually have the collaborative capacities, the teamwork skills, to work effectively in teams. Um, and finally, a lot of times, um, many teams just keep on, keep on trucking with the wrong people in the team because leaders lack the, the ability or the faith in themselves that they can handle the emotional challenge of taking somebody off the team once they've actually been invited to do it. So third positive condition, get the right people on the team, meaning all the team members have both task and teamwork skills, and you've done a thoughtful design of the diversity, the mix of perspectives and capabilities that are actually needed to do the work. So let me, let me just pause there, Krister, because I'm going to just name the, name the enablers um, and make sure that, that people have a chance to chime in on anything about the model before we look at the team diagnostic survey itself. Questions, comments, feel free to you know, unmute and come on if you want to interact with Ruth a bit or share anything. Um, I was just about to drop a, a comment in the chat window um, of it, your point about the over-inclusiveness of uh, many teams being a mm -hmm. challenge. And I have an exact uh, team coaching engagement just like that right now where the team leader, one of his great strengths is he's created a really inclusive environment. It's really warm and accepting. Uh, but in our first team coaching engagement, he brought 16 people <laughs> in his leadership team to the session. And, you know, and even in the interviews with the participants, there was a feeling that the inclusiveness was wonderful, but was shutting down their ability to make decisions. So now we've got it down to eight. So <laughs> that's been a huge jump for him. But I think we could, if we could get it down to five or so, that would be really ideal. But uh, well, yeah, so, so actually, if you just page forward to and run out the animation just on positive condition four, mm -hmm. um, it, you just raised a, an, an issue right there about the fundamental structure of that team. So, uh, you know, it's, we, we know from research that anything that's over single digits has exponentially greater process problems when you get teams that are, that are that big. And so with leadership teams, we really encourage senior leaders to think about single digits and, and don't let it go into double digits. But the second thing that I, I think is an important structural thing about inclusiveness is it is really therefore difficult when you have 16 people in the room for them to be doing real leadership work when they convene. Because what possible task could 16 people be doing other than exchanging information with each other or getting into discussions with each other you're almost certainly not going to make the big decisions with 16 people in the room, or you're never going to get around to them in the agenda. And this is one of the things that actually causes um, leaders to detach from the leadership team that they're part of and to start check, you know, surreptitiously checking their email under the table and not want to come to the meetings because the real leadership work is actually happening elsewhere. So, Positive condition number four among the enablers, provide a sound structure, meaning keep it small, give them meaningful te team tasks, and specify and maintain clear norms of conduct, the rules of engagement about what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior in the group. The second of the enablers is what we call 
operating in a supportive organizational context. So every team operates in an organizational context of some kind, which can either place obstacles in the way of their ability to operate effectively as a team, or it, it can actually provide resources and ability to work together effectively as a team. The primary um, ingredients that we have captured as the organizational context checklist, which you can see on the next slide, is that teams need the reward system to be providing positive consequences for team performance excellence. Secondly, they need an information system that is providing the data that they need to actually know how well they're doing and to plan their work. Thirdly, they need an educational system that will provide to teams any training or technical consultation they might need, including training and teamwork. And finally, they need a context that will provide to them the basic material resources, space, time, computing, whatever is essential um, for them to actually get the work to, to accomplish the work. So that is the organizational context is the second of the enablers. And then last, and Ruth, can I just jump in real quick before you go on to the last one? Douglas yeah. had a great comment here that goes back to the sound structure. He said, in some teams with whom I work, inclusion is dictated by the organization, meaning the head of the department. So how does one overcome this? Yeah, I, it's a, uh, thank you for the question. And it's, mm -hmm. it's one that I get very frequently. Um, one of the things that I invite a lot of team leaders and organizations to think about is how to accomplish inclusiveness if you have an inclusive culture without giving people a seat at the table, right? And it is possible to do that. You can have a core team that holds shared accountability for a particular task or a particular decision, and also have the obligation to bring in and include perspectives from other, from other parts of the organization. So it, the, the, uh, I, I'm not against inclusiveness, particularly when you're talking about teams who who are going to be making a decision or who are going to you know, recommend a solution that's going to affect many different parts of the organization. But there is a difference between making them a member of the team and finding some other structural way for them to have some input to ratify the decision to have some, uh, uh, to, to have some say in what is ultimately going to affect them. But it is a big, it, it, uh, my, for me, the point is not to, not to fight the inclusiveness of an organizational culture because it's probably valuable for other reasons, but not to let it drive a, an automatic and thoughtless process of, of creating teams that are way too big to get something done. Ruth, I just want to comment, because I know in your book, when I was reading senior leadership teams, you spoke about this thing about having a core decision-making team, but I think you, you spoke about consultation teams and coordination teams that you know, there are different ways to balance that inclusiveness bucket depending on what do you need a larger team for? Yes. So, right? Yes, yes. And I was in three or four types of teams. I think mm -hmm. one was decision-making, consultation, coordination, and information sharing or something like that. Yeah, from least to most interdependent, the least mm -hmm. interdependent is your information sharing or alignment team. Mm -hmm. And you can bring a lot of people together to exchange information. Um, I think it's one of the most overused and most badly used kinds of leadership teams, um, the, the way to get it wrong is, is for the senior most leader, the chief executive, to convene a large group of people because that's the most efficient way for her or for him to get information about what's going on in the organization, which means the, the information being laid out on the table is not relevant for most of the people in the room. But there are good ways to use those sorts of teams and they can, they can stand to be pretty large. It just it just means that the interchange has to be designed in ways that it's actually useful to everybody. But you're right, I, I do draw distinctions between what I would call a consultative team, a team that is there to provide advice and counsel to an individual who will then hold accountability for, for the decision. And I think that's a, a pretty significantly underutilized kind of leadership team. Uh, you know, wise mature executives under, will understand if you're not saying if you're saying to them we're not going to be making this decision by consensus but i want to hear your perspectives and i want to hear your debate with each other about the best best way to go so that i can be better prepared to make a, a good decision uh, on behalf of this organization okay 
last of the six conditions, available expert coaching. This is actually why I wound up retitling this um, presentation, helping teams rather than coaching teams. For me, what, what we mean when we are talking about coaching is direct intervention in the team process that is intended to help team members work together more effectively and use their full complement of, of resources in doing the work together. And I just want to underscore that we, we put coaching as the final enabling condition, and it is last in chronological order for a reason. And that is that we found in our research that teams that are poorly designed in the first place cannot take advantage of good coaching. Whereas teams that are well designed in the first place actually are extremely helped by effective coaching interventions uh, in uh, directly in in helping their dynamics and helping them to work together more effectively. Okay, so that's the last thing that I wanted to say about the underlying model. Let me pause and see if there's anything on people's minds before I talk a little bit about uh, about the team diagnostic survey and what it does. So Ruth, in um, <clears throat> so in your approach to the team coaching component, you know, I think for folks out there. You know, my understanding is that team coaching, like leadership, is a function of a team rather than necessarily embodied by one person. Yeah. And so that could be an external team coach, an internal team coach, a team leader, team members themselves. That's exactly right. So you, you'll see that it's um, we, what we refer to is available expert coaching, and we are completely agnostic about who is providing it. What we've seen in our research is that as long as the as long as coaching, skillful intervention in the process, somebody who is asking the question, what's working well for us? What could we be doing differently? Um, it could, in fact, come from a team member themselves. It could, under some circumstances, most effectively come from outside the team if that skill isn't already incorporated in the, in the team itself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's actually useful to have that external person there to provide it for the for the sake of objectivity, or so that everyone else can participate mm -hmm. in the dialogue. But you said something there around uh, that team coaching works when a team is designed well, mm -hmm. and and I and I think it's maybe some of your research that show that team design. And I think that's why you preface this webinar saying, you know, I, I think I've read somewhere about seventy percent of a team's outcomes and effectiveness is predicted by how well it's designed, and that team coaching can add ten. And I've seen other research up to twenty percent improvement uh, in team effectiveness, but it, that's a powerful statement on how important getting a design of a team right is. Right? Yeah, it is. It's, and and it, was, it was, in fact, my, it was, in fact, my research. I was mm. surprised when I found it. I didn't, that wasn't what I was uh, mm. thinking I was going to find. But, um, you know, I think it's important for those of us who do coach teams to recognize that that the redesign work and getting those essentials in good shape and getting the enablers in place increase the chances that the coaching work that we do is actually going to make a difference. You cannot coach people out of their process problems if they don't have a shared purpose, yeah. if the work they're doing isn't meaningful, if they're missing some core capabilities, if there are no ground rules uh, about how people actually operate, then, then trying to coach them in real time and improve their process in real time is not, is not going to help. And it's going to be as frustrating for those of us who coach as it is for the mm. team members. We had a, a comment here and a question from Hillary who said, on a piece of work, we increase the size of the team structurally, but relationally, the original smaller of team of three became the inner core. We struggle to integrate and change the behavior. Any thoughts? Um, I, yes, I don't. I'll just offer this thought. I don't know, Hillary, if this is how you actually went about it. But one of the things that many team leaders have found a particularly helpful idea is the idea of a team relaunch. And um, it's, it's, it's really calling a do over. It's calling a halt and saying this team is not working as it is. And so in essence, we're going to we are going to disband the team. We're going to celebrate what we've accomplished so far, and it is going to be restarted in a, in a different configuration. And doing, that, and doing that as if the team were starting, um, starting a brand new team 
clarifying the purpose, clarifying who the membership is and why, what are the norms of conduct going to be, um, giving them an interdependent piece of work to accomplish. That can actually that can actually trigger a new set of processes um, because what you've got is a different configuration of people and purposes and work. So Ruth, we're about 15 minutes out from the end of the session. So what would be a good use of the time now? Do you want to dive a bit into what does some of the team diagnostic survey look like, the results or? What, yeah, what sure. How about, how about a few, how about a, leave this slide up for a minute. I'll say yeah. a couple of words about, about mm -hmm. the survey itself. So uh, um, Richard and Aaron and I, uh, after all these years of studying teams and creating various instrumentation for measuring all of these different things in organizations, um, decided to create the Team Diagnostic Survey, which is uh, available now as an online instrument for assessing teams on those three criteria of effectiveness, on those task processes, and on the six um, essential and enabling conditions. It's a, it's a, uh, it's been tested in a variety of different settings. We published the validation stuff in the Journal of Applied Behavioral Sciences. Um, it is a, a survey instrument that team members themselves and the team leader, if there is a designated team leader, respond to a series of descriptive questions about the team. Uh, it requires 80% of the members to respond in order to get a report, but it produces a visual report and a summary of how well designed is the team, how effective is it in its ultimate performance effectiveness, how effective are its processes. And there are a whole, whole variety of different ways to use it. If you page through the next couple of slides, Krista, just to give people an image of the kinds of things that, that it's cap capturing and what it is that you would see. Um, this is actually the model that I talked to you through earlier. All the way over on the right are the three criteria of effectiveness. So is the team performing well? Is it getting more capable as a performing unit over time? How satisfied are members? In the middle are those three key task processes, and over on the left are, are the scores on the essential conditions. This is meant to be a, a simple visual summary of what's going well for this. This is a real team I'm showing you, by the way. It's a pretty effective leadership team that we're looking at. Um, as usual, it's sort of the stoplight colors. The closer it is to, to deep green, the better shape it's in. The closer it is to red, uh, and the further away it is from the ideal triangle, the the more likely it is that the, the team has some um, problems in that dimension. So if you just take a look at this particular team, you can see overall that while they have high quality processes and the members are generally pretty satisfied with the team, there are some concerns about how uh, how effective the this team is performing and if you look all the way over on the left We've got some clues right away as to where we would actually look to think about how we would improve the performance effectiveness of this team So its direction doesn't seem to be very compelling and it looks like it's got some structural problems as somebody who wanted to be helpful with this team That's where I would start my closer investigation and thinking about what actually needs to be redesigned about this team so if you'll flip forward a couple there's additional detail in here. Um, as I said earlier, we saw that this particular team was struggling a little around its compelling direction. And if you go one more slide forward, there's additional detail about, so what is the problem with the direction for this particular team? And what we see is that while it seems to be pretty challenging and it really is gonna make a difference to, to people, it's not entirely clear what their purpose is as a leadership team. I shared this one with you on purpose because this is actually a fairly typical pattern in leadership teams, which is what we do is really, really important. It makes a lot of difference to people if only we knew what it was, so. Yeah, Ruth, I'd love for you to uh, comment just a little bit on the clarity thing because, you know, all the teams that I've used the TDS on and even teams that I haven't, the clarity thing just, you know, it's, I've re I haven't found many teams that are very clear. <laughs> you know, on yeah, if you work with a lot of leadership teams, that's, that is a very common phenomenon. The individual jobs and what each of those individuals is responsible for in the organization, I think is often very clear to those individuals. But the question of what is our unique added value as a team 
over and above what each of the individuals do is a very challenging conceptual task. And a lot of chief executives have not figured out how to articulate, what do I want this team to decide together by consensus? What do I want them collectively be, to be doing and leading at an enterprise level over and above what I'm asking of them as individuals? Um, and and that, that is much harder to do for a leadership team than it is for a lot of other kinds of more straightforward task performing teams. Okay, so maybe we'll pop one question in here. Uh, Margaret was wondering earlier around the whole idea, she liked the idea of the team relaunch mm -hmm. and was wondering, does that work well with boards who take on new team members to give the group a fresh start? Yeah, it, that, that's actually a, a, a great place to do it. Um, one of my, one of my um, standard practices with the team diagnostic survey or with any other method of sort of tapping how well designed the team is or any, um, any change in their composition or purposes is to look for natural breakpoints in the life of the group and to call a pause and to debrief how things have gone so far and to ask whether this is, is this a point of relaunch? Many, many boards and many teams have sort of onboarding practices that they do um, usually intended to just incorporate a new member and get them aligned with what the norms of conduct are or get them up to speed. Um, but really, it can be a wonderful moment for re-clarifying um, and re-underscoring who we are and what we actually I exist to accomplish. And, you know, very often things have shifted in the external environment or shifted in the internal environment where maybe taking a look at our core purposes as, as a team we'll notice some things that, that actually need to change about how we're thinking about ourselves. Cool, so Ruth, we've got about four or five minutes maybe for you to share. I don't know if you wanna share an example, I wanna leave a few minutes at the end for you know, participating final questions or comments, but um, where do you wanna go from here? Do you want to, um, I think you have an example Sure. It was, you know, I started this, this dialogue at the beginning by saying very often people come to you with a particular, um, with a particular sense of what is causing their problem as a team. And I just want to offer two illustrations from my, my own work. Um, the first one was a leadership team where the chief executive basically said to me, why do I feel like, like I am leading this organization alone, that I don't have a team around me and I'm trying to push a boulder uphill all by myself. I'm pretty sure that I've been clear about the strategy and yet we don't seem to be able to get any traction on it. And when we did the team diagnostic survey with this team, um, we saw a pattern that was raising questions about whether the team members actually felt like they were accountable for anything as a team, right? There, as I had said earlier to Krista, the individual roles were very clear, but the question of what we do as a team um, was not clear and was not compelling. Uh, and, and much of what they were doing when they convened as a group was, was actually just discussing things and not even making decisions. So the tasks that were placed on the table in front of them were not motivating leadership work. And going back to, to actually conduct a, a relaunch with this team and to create a real team with a compelling purpose and meaningful agendas on the table actually helped this senior leader to feel like we actually are leading this organization with an aligned leadership team that is providing all that st strategic leadership um, together that, that it takes to actually execute a change in, in our strategy. Um, and, and it really made it possible for the team to have a dialogue with each other about what they needed in order to be effective as a team. Same thing with the, the, the example of working with the team as a whole. In that first instance, I was primarily um, serving uh, as a coach to the team leader about his team. I've also used the team diagnostic survey with a lot of frontline teams as a whole, where they can look at their, their data together and and figure out why they are so mired in conflict, for example, and, inabil and unable to actually um, ac accomplish things together that, uh, that were important to them. In this particular team that I was thinking about, what the TDS taught us was that they had actu actually a pretty wide disagreement with each other about what their purposes were as a team, 
that they were struggling in an organizational context where the rewards were far more focused on individual performance than on collective performance. And they were also a highly diverse team that had never established any clear norms of conduct. And again, going back with them and saying, okay, so how do we redesign the performance conditions under which we operate, um, including in this case, actually recomposing the team and establishing some norms of conduct, got them onto a, a positive trajectory. But it really externalized for them a, a diagnosis of what was what were some of the obstacles that were getting in their way that enabled them to turn it into a collaborative task to actually fix those things together. Anybody go further? I think. Let's see what other what other uh, comments and questions people have about the survey itself or about using it. Mm. And since we are at five minutes to the hour, I'd I'd love to hear what's on people's minds. So I got one private question just around where do you go to test or examine the TDS? Mm. So that was one question that came in. You may want to um, you comment on there. And I did you know mention here in the chat window that. Next week, if you're going to be at Columbia's coaching conference, I'm going to be hosting a panel, moderating a panel, Pioneers in Team Coaching, and Ruth will be one of seven really great thought leaders in the team coaching space. They're all going to be beaming in by Zoom. I'll be there live with the audience. Uh, so if you're going to be at the conference, would would love to see you there. Um, it'd be great to, to have you there. Um, and also, you know, in November in New York City, November 9 to 11, we're going to have a three-day course with Ruth called Diagnosing and Coaching Teams Using the Team Diagnostic Survey. So if you want to check that out, I'll pop the information in the chat window of where to go look at the website for that. And if you want to uh, get a discount, I'll put a discount code and then we're going to give you $300 off if you sign up for that. We have 10 people registered so far. Uh, we're going to take up to 20. We have one person coming in from Australia, which is pretty awesome, and one from Paris. So people are coming in from around the world. I think it's going to be a great session. But um, Ruth, you put in here where people could check it out. And yeah, um, we, have, we have colleagues in the UK who actually run the site for us, and I just gave you the web link there to go check out the team diagnostic survey. There's a little presentation online on their site that also that talks about it, but um, we set people up to do a test team, so we're, we're happy to have people actually try it out um, at, with, a, with a team that they care about and take a look at the uh, the data, that's the link there. Um, the, there was a question I saw from Sean about how long it takes to fill it out. It's about a 20 to 30 minute survey for team members. It covers um, other things that I haven't discussed in this presentation today, uh, including things like team psychological safety, the quality and focus of the coaching that is provided by the team leader and the team members. So there are a variety of other things in the in the survey as well, which you can see if you, uh, if you go try it out online. Mm -hmm. I've used the team diagnostic survey with a number of teams this year. And uh, what I really liked about it, and I think one of the advantages of an instrument is it can kind of cut to, like to say, cut to the quick, really quickly to get at the heart of usually what's holding a team back. And you can get that through doing interviews and surveys and other data collection methods. But what's nice is there's a model that kind of packages it for you. So I think it kind of can really accelerate that process. Um, and there's a question there about the cost. So once you get certified in the instrument, Ruth, what's the ongoing cost structure for? At the, at the moment where we are, we are doing for single teams for a basic report, it's a, for us, the basic report, which is just the, the overview that you saw there and a little bit of breakdown into the six conditions is $125. I think if I remember rightly, it's, it's two ninety five per per team for the whole complete report with all of the. It's uh, actually three ninety five. Thank you. <laughs> I've been using it. In my I knew that. I, knew, you know. I knew that you were actually going to know that the answer yeah, yeah. better than I do. Um, I have not been. I yeah. Paying attention. Which is to which is pretty. I think it's very competitive with some of the other instruments. They're kind of ranging between four hundred and a thousand, depending on. But there's a handful that are in the four hundred to six hundred range for a, a team. Some of them are based on per team member costs, but 
you know. Yeah, no, we don't do that. Yeah, but this is a team. Like this is a it. team level report, and yeah. it's, well, it's a team level. It's pretty solid. I mean, I think you get a twenty-five page report, and I found that to have more than enough value in it. Um, you can get a lot of mileage out of it, so I, I found it really worth the money. You know, well, you, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear your feedback and this group's feedback at some point. Mm -hmm. I've I've made a, a concerted effort to write into the report itself. Um, some diagnostic and interpretive information about why you would get weak scores on each of the conditions and drawing on, on our, uh, our research and practice and mm. using it with a whole variety of different teams. The other thing I would say, you know, what I liked is there's a whole bunch of like bo what I call bonus material in the instrument. So you yeah. get things like the team's um, psychological safety, their uh, learning, commitment to learning. Because one of the, I think, great things that I've commented on some of my blog posts about your work, Ruth, is that you found that about 20% of teams in your research were high performing, and about 20% of teams also had a strong commitment to their learning as a team. Right. So a huge correlation or connection between teams learning and team performance. And yeah. um, so you get some of that in there. There's some also great feedback for the, the team leader. So I think there's some great stuff that goes beyond just the core model that also I found had some good value with it. There's a great question here from Sean saying, any experience uh, with teams repeating the survey six to 12 months later to measure improvement? Yeah, I, I actually always do that with leadership teams. And, and my preference is, is to do it um, at six and, and 12 months because there are a lot of things that they'll make um, some pretty fundamental progress in improving their basic design conditions within a few months. In fact, it's 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 actually not difficult to see a, a radical improvement in the uh, in the three essentials in a relatively short period of time. But very often, those outcomes take longer to play out. So to do a kind of repeated uh, repeated measures version of it over time and show them the way in which. Uh, getting their themselves better designed as a team ultimately has them uh, performing more effectively is uh, is very helpful to them. Elena asked here about seeing an example report. Uh, I, we do have one. I believe Laura has one on their website. If they don't, um, shoot me an email. I have I have lots of mm. sample reports that I could yeah. share with you. Yeah. And if people want to get in touch with you, Ruth, what's um, what's a good way to connect with you? Um, via email, which is uh, R Wagaman here. I'm going to just put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So while you're typing that in, um, you know, other resources. I did a podcast with Ruth. I also did a podcast with Trexler Profit one of Ruth's colleagues, where we actually went through a whole hour-long episode going through the, the team diagnostic survey, which you can check out. Those are free at the Team Coaching Zone, which you can also find on iTunes and SoundCloud and some of those platforms. Some of the books today, I think, also mentioned on leading teams, setting the stage for great performances, and Ruth's book, Senior Leadership Teams, What It Takes to Make Them Great, I think some great resources. Ruth and I co-published a couple of blog posts on a two-part blog post series on the team diagnostic survey, which you can find on LinkedIn and on, on the team coaching zone. If you want to check that out, I know you have the article Ruth on a theory of team coaching for those who are more interested in, mm -hmm. you know, that work. Uh, anything else you would steer people to in terms of um, resources if they want to look at your work in, in more detail or that's probably a, enough. It probably is. <laughs> people busy for a time being. Enough. I, there, are, there are a variety of different, um, presentations that I have done, including at the International Coaching Federation mm. um, just this month that have been recorded and posted mm. online. Okay. Uh, and that was a the, that was a workshop in which people are actually working with the team diagnostic survey mm. and uh, and learning how to learning how to use it. So yeah. And for the workshop in November, Ruth, you want to make any sort of plug for what uh, the approach to that if, if folks are considering Oh so yes, that's actually sure. that's actually done very hands on. So we will we'll spend some time digging more into um, a, a deeper understanding of these underlying conditions. But we'll be working with real data from real teams and developing in in peer groups consultative approaches to how you would help these different kinds of teams. We'll be practicing and role playing that in real time. And then the third day of the workshop, we will have a real live senior leader who actually wants a consultation on uh, her leadership team. And we'll have the opportunity that, to actually coach her using this uh, underlying model and the, and the team diagnostic mm -hmm. survey. 
Nice. Well, we'd love to see you, anyone there who's interested in coming. This is the second uh, event that the Team Coaching Zone hosted this year. We brought Peter Hawkins over from the UK in January and uh, was sold out. It was really awesome. And I think what's great about those trainings is not just the content you get, but it's the connecting to the people who are there and just getting to soak for a couple of days in steep uh, on the content as well as with the people, I think is 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 great. And I know um, we've been have we had we've had asks uh, from the podcast, um, Ruth, about you coming to Australia, and uh, Hillary saying here, please come to the UK. <laughs> so uh, for those out there who want to organize an event, <laughs> you know you've got Ruth's email there. So feel free to pull something together. I know you know there's actually a really a, actually Europe and Western Europe, in particular in the UK, has a really uh, rich team coaching community. Australia is also one where there's a lot of interest in team coaching. So there's kind of pockets around the world where there's a lot of, there's a lot of action going on in team, team coaching. So good stuff. So um, Ruth, any sort of final comments here? I think we're going to start to, you know, close this down and say goodbye, but let me just, let me just thank you for coming today. It's really, you know, great to be around. You know, there's a saying that you're the product of the five people that you spend the most time with. And um, you know, to extend that metaphor a little bit, just hanging around, I think with people like you, it's really great for us, you know, uh, just to learn and learn through osmosis and proximity, but um, pick up, picked up some good things from today. And so again, an honor to have you. If you're going to be at the Columbia Coaching Conference next week, we'd love to see you at the panel on pioneers and team coaching. And if you're interested in checking out the, uh, the session in November, feel free to be in touch. And uh, Ruth, I'll leave it to you for the final final word, and then we can just, say goodbye. Just to me. say thank you, and I hope this has been helpful to all of you in your coaching work, and I look forward to connecting again in some venue. And Krista, I'll see you next week. Awesome. Uh, virtually, at least. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. All right, thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, I'm going to stop the thank recording, you. and we can linger around here if anybody has any final questions or comments for Ruth or I. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.